how to um, identify individuals and how to use the tool of genetic profiling to identify individuals and species. So before I go on, remember that the whole, um, the whole principle of genetic profiling is really asking the question of how we can use how we can use differences in DNA sequences to tell the difference or similarity between individuals. For example, finding who's the parent of uh, a child or uh, identifying a, a criminal based on DNA sample from a crime scene or we can similarly use the very same technique to see how similar or different two species are. Okay, and this gives us information about um, how closely related two species might be in evolutionary terms. Okay, so what we need to do is first we need to see what are these differences in DNA and the next thing we're gonna do is then look at how genetic profiling takes advantage of those differences in DNA. What we have to remember is that our DNA in our nucleus, in our genome, is very large and it contains many genes. And, you know, all these genes do different things. Gene 1, gene 2, gene 3. Okay? And remember that all of these genes give rise to or have the instructions to make proteins that determines our characteristics. Okay? Now, the thing about all these genes is that within the gene, <coughs> within the gene, it is not as straightforward as one gene, one protein, because if we zoom into a gene, we would find that within the gene, there are little sections that actually make it into the mRNA and, and other sections that don't make it into the mRNA. So when transcription happened, so we start from there, so this whole section was transcribed into, yeah, DNA gene transcribed, make an, M, uh, make an RNA. But what I'm telling you now is that actually that mRNA contained bits originally that were cut out, yeah? So these bits are called exons and these bits are called introns. Okay, so exon, intron, exon, intron, exon. Now, what happens to this RNA? In order to, for this RNA to become mRNA, the introns are removed. So, so we get an, a little bit of a shorter one here where Making sense? So the introns are, were removed. The introns were removed and then the three remaining exons were joined together and this is what we call the mRNA. Yeah, and it's the mRNA that gets translated by ribosomes. So remember that exons contain the information the, or the base sequences that contain the information for codons, which will eventually result in uh, information to join amino acids together, whereas introns never affect the protein structure. Does that make sense? Because introns were never read. So introns, the sequences that were in the intron region, were never read by ribosomes. So it would never um, contribute to the protein's amino acid sequence. 
is, there's, there's a few kind of inferences that we have to make for that. What this means is that information, information in exons is more important than information in introns, okay? So the base sequence in exons, because it codes for the protein, this information is very important. Whereas the introns, we can say that's less important because it's going to get cut out of the mRNA, it's going to get cut out of the RNA anyway before it becomes uh, yeah, before it gets used to make a protein. So what we're saying is, is a mutation, so if there was a mutation, is that mutation more dangerous here, or is it more dangerous there in the intron? Okay, so mutations are more dangerous here because that's going to cause a change in the amino acid sequence of a protein. Whereas a mutation happens in the intron, does it affect protein structure? No. Okay, that leads us to our next point, which is then the sequences of introns are more genetically variable than the sequences of exons. Does that make sense? Because, simply because, when, whenever there's a mutation that's occurred in a population that's in, been in an intron, it's not affected the survival chance of that, spe of that individual. Whereas any mutation that happened in any of the exons usually would negatively affect that species. Making sense? And then that individual didn't survive and didn't reproduce and therefore when there was a mutation in this exon, that individual never passed that, that allele down to their offspring. Whereas mutations happening in introns all the time, and it doesn't affect whether someone can survive to reproduction, re reproductive age. And therefore they pass that allele on. Okay, so that's why you get more variable sequences in introns than exons. Now what we do is we look at what the nature of these variations are. Okay, so if we did look at these introns, if we did look at intron sequence, what we would find is that in many cases they contain these sequences that look like this. Yeah, repeating sequences of a few bases. Yeah, and <clears throat> so introns, so the next point is that, so what we said was introns contain more genetic sequence variation than exons. So it makes sense that if, if I want to tell the difference between two people, do I want to look at their exon sequences or their intron sequences? I want to look at their introns because they're more likely to be different. Now, what kind of differences do these introns contain? That is now what we're looking at. And what these introns contain are, are these kind of repeating sequences called short tandem, short tandem repeats, or S T. Ours. And the convenient thing is that when we look at, for example, person one and person two, they, in the same gene, in the same location, they will have both have GAGA, -A, yeah? But person one will have one, two, three, four, five repeats of GAGA. -A. So, you know, person A will have one, two, three, four, five, five repeats. Whereas if I look at person B, they might have two repeats.
So in, when I look at person 2, in this particular gene, in this particular intron, person 2 might have, or person B might have, two repeats. It doesn't affect the function of the gene. They might even have you know, almost identical copies of the exon sequences, but, they, but they're likely to have differences in these numbers of repeats. Okay, so how, how can this affect, how can we use this to tell the difference between people? So what this means is that if person A has got five repeats, they have longer introns. Yeah, because this person's got one, two, three, four, five repeats of GAGA, -GA, so but the person who's got two repeats, they will have they will have shorter introns for this particular gene. Yeah? Okay. And this is what genetic profiling takes advantage of. Genetic profiling, what it does is it essentially cuts out these introns and allows us to compare whether someone has a long intron or a short intron. Yeah, and in that way we can tell how similar they are. If the introns happen to be similar lengths, then we assume that they are closely related. And if the introns are very different lengths, then we assume that these two species or individuals are distantly related. That. Yeah. So I guess the, the, the take-home message is, the bottom line for this one is, individuals, individuals or different species will have differences in STRs, so the number of STR repeats. This this causes differences in DNA fragment length. Yeah, more repeats, longer fragments, fewer repeats, shorter fragments. Yeah, and DNA profiles, so I'll just get rid of some of my diagrams here. Genetic profiles separate DNA fragments based on their size or length. So DNA profiling is a technique that allows us to separate these fragments based on their size and therefore allows us to compare either individuals or species. Okay, so now we look at the procedure by which we make one of these profiles and how we can make the, the comparison that tells us about um, similarities and difference between individuals and species. So DNA profiling is going to have a number of stages. First of all, we need to isolate DNA from our, our biological sample. So it could, whatever we do, we've got to use biological material and get some DNA. Two is we must then chop that DNA up to cut out our introns. Remember we said that it's the introns that we're interested in we need to cut those introns out of the big long DNA molecules and so we can compare them. And that's what we call creating, creating the fragments. Once we've got those fragments, remember our DNA sample might be quite a small one and so we must amplify the DNA. Okay, and just for your reference, we create the fragments using restriction enzymes and we amplify DNA using the polymerase chain reaction.
Once we've amplified the DNA, then we separate, we separate the fragments based on size, and that is the electrophoresis. And finally, we, we, you know, we can't really see the DNA at this point, even though we have separated the fragments based on size, and essentially we've created a profile, but we can't see it until, we can't see those bands until we visualize um, the DNA or specific parts of the DNA. Okay, so let's begin with isolating DNA.